Welcome to our gardening lecture series and the final lecture on annual and perennial plants for water gardens. My name is Robin Pollock. I have been a master gardener since 2005 and also an art teacher for 35 years. As an artist, I like to focus on color, texture, and shape in my garden, as well as in my water garden. Today we are going to be introduced to pond plants. I will talk about the different types and give you 16 of my favorite water garden plants and six plants to avoid. At the end, we will take your questions, so please save your questions until the very end. Thank you. Is your water garden looking more like a fish pond than a water garden? Are your containers full of water, but missing the actual plants? Ponds and water gardens are a wonderful addition to any outdoor space. Their soothing sounds of rippling water make them key aspects in feng shui and healing gardens. And when you add a variety of water garden plants, they are, add enormous visual interest as well. When you think of a water garden, the painting of Monet's water lilies may come to mind. This pond is in Givernier, France, and is filled with Asian water lilies. But there are a lot of pond plants that we can use right here in Georgia, and using native pond plants is beneficial to the wildlife and aquatic animals that are attracted to your pond. You might already have a pond or water garden, but if you're get, just getting started, don't get put off by the idea. Water gardening does not have to be complicated. You don't need a waterfall, a pump, a fountain, or even an in-ground pool. You can have a water garden on a gar balcony or small patio. All it takes is a container that holds water and your choice of appropriate plants. The container can be a simple pot without drainage holes, or the lightweight resin type, which are perfect for small water gardens. But a water garden isn't a water garden until it has aquatic plants to show up. Whether you want floating plants, marginal plants, bog plants, or any plant, the right greenery can turn your water garden into an oasis of your favorite colors, textures, and scents. 
And don't forget about the lulling sound of rippling water. Choose species that will add height and color around the pond's edge, as well as those that sit, float on the pond surface. This will create a multi-layered effect with contrasting hues and texture, adding more visual interest while keeping your pond healthy. There are plenty of plants to choose from, but some require more maintenance than others. While some water garden plants might be pretty, their aggressive spreading nature can make them a no-no for your quiet getaway. Remember, water garden plants should relax you, not stress you out. The more manageable the plants are, the more relaxing your water garden is for you. You won't squeeze in a relaxing, quiet meditation by the water's edge if you're worried about your lettuce overtaking the water pond. When do I call a professional? Well, it might be easy to know what plants you want, but deciding where to put them might be more difficult. When you haven't a clue about the best, best plant arrangement for your water garden, call a landscape professional in your area. They can help you determine which textures and colors go well together and how to arrange your plants so you can see all their blooms, colors, and foliage. They can also provide pond maintenance and installation solutions. Typically, water garden plants are divided into a few categories, though there is a lot of overlapping with some plants suitable for more than one condition. In addition to being beautiful, pond plants can provide countless other benefits to your pond. They oxygenate and filter the water, making it healthier for frogs and fish. And frogs and fish can also benefit from the shelter that the leaves provide and the plants that hide them from predators. Best of all, since water garden plants absorb nutrients while also blocking out sunlight, they help to limit algae growth in your pond. This means a lot less maintenance all season long. So we need to understand plant terminology before we discuss them. The first are moisture loving plants. These plants prefer moist conditions, but don't need to be in standing water. Marginal plants, are grow with their roots in water and their foliage above. They usually grow on the edge of the water. And of course, the depth of the water will depend on the specific species. Some, such as water lily and water lotus, require deeper water. Others prefer shallow water or even damp garden beds. There's a wide overlapping between moisture lovers and marginals. Next, we have floating plants. These plants live on the surface of the water and do not need their roots in soil at all. They will often dig into the mud on the bottom of the plants, but they do not need their roots planted. They absorb their nutrients from the water directly and do not need soil to grow. They also provide shelter for aquatic animals and also shade the surface of the water helping again to prevent algae. Floating plants are not usually very winter hardy, but you can overwinter a portion in an indoor greenhouse or aquarium. Next, we have submerged plants. These grow underwater near the surface and help oxygenate the water. They live at the bottom of ponds and live completely underwater. They also discourage algae by absorbing nutrients from the water. As with floating plants, they provide habitat and shelter for underwater creatures. Soil is usually not needed for their survival, though they too will often root at the mud in the bottom of a pond. Many plants are super spreaders. To help control them, Plant them in pots and be aware that you might have to thin them out and share them with friends or compost them 
with unwanted extras. There are some plants that you need to avoid. Aquatic plants that have a rapid rate of growth or a creeping nature can be aggressive. Many of these problematic plants have become invasive in our natural habitat. Many of these plants were introduced even by the horticulture trade before they were deemed invasive. Be sure you learn about the plants that you use in your own water garden and never introduce them into a natural wetland of any time. There are many submerged plants that are sold as aquarium plants too, and they're oxygenators, but they have become severe pests in parts of the US. These include things like the Brazilian waterweed or the Eurasian millefoil. Some invasives resemble native submerged aquatic plants, so be sure of what species you introduce to your water garden. Several non-native floating plants have become invasive, including some that are now established in natural areas disrupting ecosystem. Some examples are water hyacinth, water lettuce, and crested floating heart. Marginal wetland plants also sown as, sold as ornamentals can be serious problems, such as yellow flag iris, giant reeds, and purple loosestrife. But to help you get started, I've compiled a list of 16 plants perfect for water gardens that we are going to discuss in detail. You see on your screen some native pond plants. You notice the common name on the left column, the botanical name next, the type, whether it's marginal, floating, or submerged, the depth it should be planted, the height it grows, the bloom that, it occur that occurs, and the foliage. You might want to look through this list while we're discussing them so that you can attract wildlife and aquatics by planting native pond plants. The first of my favorite plants is the water, is the lot of water garden plants is the lotus. The lotus is a beautiful plant that reaches above the surface of the water. You can turn your water garden into a show place with the lotus flowers striking symmetry and colors. It's easy to confuse these pond plants with water lilies. Remember, the lotus flower rises well above the water while the water lily floats flowers float. Now I'm going to tell you on each of my favorite garden plants what the hardiness zone is, what is the scientific name, the common name, and their growing conditions. We are in 7b, 8a hardiness zone. So the lotus is 4 through 10. Science Typic name as Nelumbo nucifera, and the common names are the Sacred Heart, Indian Lotus, Egyptian Bean, and Bean of India. Lotus grow at the bottom of your water garden in submerged containers without drainage holes. These flowers will grow through the water and bloom above the water surface. These plants prefer full sunlight but they can handle a little bit of shade. The next of my favorite garden plants is sweet flag. It's a great bright green monocot and it adds texture around your water garden. Sweet flag exists in clumps spreading via underground rhizomes. It can create a dense ground cover over time, though it's not considered invasive. If you sniff off its leaves, you can get a plant, a, a whiff of the plant's sweet scent. It is in hardiness zone six through nine, and some varieties are even hardy through four through 11. The scientific name is Acorus calamus, and the common name is calamus, or sweet flag. These marginal plants tolerate partial shade, 
and like full sun. The more sun they receive, the more water they will need. They do not tolerate dry soil at all. Its sweet flag thrives in consistently moist soil or standing water of about four to six inches. The next of my favorite water garden plant is the cattail. Swaying cattails bring relaxation to your water garden. When the cattails are ready to spread their seeds, the brown flowers will pop open revealing a mass of soft fluff. The wind then carries these fluffy seed clumps to new areas, allowing cattails to spread with ease. They are hardy in zones three through 10. The scientific name is Typha, and commonly we know it as reed mace, bulrush, reed, punks, kumbungi, and rapo. Cattails grow well in 12 inches of water or very moist soil. Plant the cattails in pots to prevent their aggressive rhizome from spreading. They can tolerate partial shade, but of course prefer full sunlight. The next of the favorite water garden plants is the purple pitcher plant. Carnivorous purple pitcher plants are some of the first to install in your water garden's boggy area. If you have a bog area and a bog garden, they'll grow well there too. Talk about low maintenance. You don't need to feed these hungry aquatic plants. Pitcher plants set their own traps. They're hardy in zone two through nine and their scientific name is Saracenia purpia. Their common name is purple pitcher plant, turtle socks, northern pitcher plant, and side saddle flower. Plant these bog plants, which are carnivorous, at the edge of your water garden. They flourish in moist soil that isn't too rich or fertile. Various pitcher plants will require a specific soil mixture, but most thrive in peat moss and um, soil. Uh, peat moss, grow your purple pitcher plant in full sun. The next is canna lily. Does your water garden need a tropical twist? If yes, squeeze in some red, orange, or yellow canna lilies. Their tall, erect blooms and ornamental leaves will add a finishing touch to your water garden. They are hardy in zone 8 through 12, scientific name canna, and the common name is canna and canna lily. Canna is like most moist, boggy conditions with full sun. They do uh, tolerate well draining organic rich soil that is either neutral or slightly acidic. The other showstopper is water lilies. There are two main types of water lilies. They're hardy and they're tropicals. Hardy water lilies will weather the winter if you plant them below the water's freezing line. Tropical water lilies will not survive the cold and will need to be treated as annuals or bring them in and store them in a warm place through the winter. Regardless of which type you choose, hardy and tropical lilies will add color to your water garden and the lily pads may become a place for resting frogs. Water lilies are hardy in zones four through 11 and tropical water lilies will grow <clears throat> in zone nine through 11 all year long. The scientific name is Nymphaea and the common name are water lilies. Plant your water lilies in containers at the bottom of your water garden and watch their, blo their blo blooms blossom over the surface of the water. Most water lilies can withstand a little shade, but only depths of six to eight inches, 
but you may need to adjust this step depending on the variety you grow. Ooh, let's talk about tiger lilies. The tiger lily is native to Asia and has become a naturalized plant throughout many New England areas. It's sought after for its showy bright color bloom and unusual speckled dots. Luckily, it won't roar and scare your other water garden plants or your fish. It's hardy in zone three through nine. The scientific name is Lilium lancifolium and the common name is tiger lily. Tiger lilies crave moist, fertile soil with good drainage. They can tolerate full sun or part shade and make an addition, uh, excellent addition to your water's edge. Pickerel weed is another plant that I like for water gardens. Mix up your water garden with various plant heights. Pickerel weed can reach up to five feet tall above the water surface. It's a treat for the eyes and the plant's purple spears sprouting towards the sky give a lot of visual interest. Pickerel has another benefit for water gardens. It is frequently used to stabilize retention ponds and banks of natural bodies of water. It is hardy in zone three through 10. The scientific name is Pontideria cortata, and the common name is pickerel weed in the United States as well as uh, the United Kingdom. It develops well in shallow water, about three to five inches with plenty of sunshine. Planted in containers, to avoid any unwanted spreading. Another wonderful plant is the marsh marigold. You value the oasis your water garden has become. You can make it even more relaxing with marsh marigold's little spots of yellow sunshine. The marsh marigold is a perennial herb in the buttercup family. The plant's glossy green leaves can appear round, kidney-shaped, oval, or even heart shape. Its various leaf shapes and small clumps of yellow flowers will bring added texture to your water garden. But note that marsh marigold can cause skin irritation and it's poisonous to consume for humans as well as livestock. <laughs> the next favorite water garden plant is the cardinal flower. The cardinal plant's brilliant red flower will put on a show in your water garden, and the trumpet-like bloom will invite ruby-throated hummingbirds to your backyard getaway. It is hardy in zones three through nine. Its scientific name is Lobelia cardinalis, and the common name is red lobelia. Cardinal flowers do great with morning sun and afternoon shade, except in colder regions where they do need full sun. They prefer moist, fertile soil and can tolerate poor drainage. The next is a Japanese iris. Japanese, Japanese iris produce ruffled, intricate blooms standing tall above their sword-like leaves. They can grow up to four feet tall with leaves reaching up to two feet, creating a beautiful border around your water garden. They're hardy in zones four through nine. The scientific name Japanese iris includes three iris species grown in gardens or existing in the wild in Japan. These spe species include Hanashoba, Katasuba, and Ayama. Hatasuma is the one that is most common and called Japanese iris outside of Japan. The common name is Japanese water iris and they grow best in moist boggy areas with humus rich soil and acidic water. These plants thrive in full sun 
two-part shade and can live up to six in six inches of water, standing water. In winter, Japanese iris rhizomes may rot in standing water and boggy soils. So it's best to plant the flower in pots that you can later remove from the ground in the fall and winter to avoid the rotting. The next water garden plant is the mosaic plant. The mosaic plant will turn your water garden into an art piece with its diamond leaves and yellow blooms. It's you hardy in zone nine through 11. The scientific name is Ludwigia sidonius. The common name is false loose stripe. The growing conditions are mosaic plants are intolerant of alkaline water. It prefers a pH between 5.5 and 7.5 and may die in a pH above 8. It floats on the water surface growing best at your pond shallow edge. Grow it in full sun to part shade. The swamp lily is another favorite water garden plant. It gives a splash of color for otherwise a dull water garden. So the swamp lily's white bloom, white after all, is the com combination of all colors and it pops in the water garden. This bulbous perennial has six delicate white petals, long purple stamens, and a sweet fragrance. It's hardy in zone seven through 11. The scientific name is Crinum pendulatum. The common name is river lily, mangrove lily, or string lily. It thrives in consistently moist soil with good drainage. It requires full sun and can flourish in up to six inches of standing water. The corkscrew rush. It will fit right into your water or container garden, especially if you're looking for an unruly, wild look. Its long blades twist and curl from the base to the blossoming foliage. For visual interest, add to your water garden corkscrew rushes, crazy twists and turns. It is hardy in zones not four through nine, and its scientific name is Juncus Ephesus spiralis. It is a cultivar of the soft rush family. The common name is Juncus spiralis twisted and tri twisted rush. Corkscrew rush grows best in full sun. In areas with extreme heat, the plant will tolerate partial shade. It prospers in boggy areas and looks great near the water's edge. Broadleaf arrowhead is another favorite water garden plant. It's a perennial and forms dense clusters emerging up to four feet tall. Its arrowhead shaped leaves feature various size coupled with three petals and white flowers. It's hardy in zone five through 10. The scientific name is Sagittaria latifolia, and the common names are duck potato, Indian potato, and wapato. It grows as a plant, a broadleaf arrowhead in consistently wet soil, or up to six to 12 inches of water. This plant prefers areas of full sun. And the last favorite water garden plant I'm going to talk about today is the blue flag iris. This clump forming blue flag iris sprouts up to three feet above sword shaped leaves. Its leaves either stand erect or arch, typically reaching about two feet. Note that the blue flag iris can spread quickly. It's best to, for water gardeners to keep this plant under control if they want their water garden to flaunt this attractive bloom while also preserving native plants. 
It is um, hardy in zones three through nine. The scientific name is Iris versicola. The common names are blue flag iris, harlequin blue flag, larger blue flag, and poison flag. It likes loamy organic rich soil and it can survive at the water's edge or up to four inches of standing uh, water. Now there are some water garden plants that are highly invasive and you may want to avoid them. The first of these is the water hyacinth. It is both a curse and a gift. Its erect blooms can sprinkle the water garden with its purple petal and dots of yellow. But while the water hyacinth may be a lovely plant to look at, its invasive quality make it difficult to control. Water hyacinth quickly multiply and can create a dense cover over your entire water feature. Overgrowth can limit sunlight from reaching aquatic life. As the plant dies, oxygen will be depleted from the water garden. If it invades local waterways, it can pose a severe risk and threat to biodiversity. The second plant to avoid is duckweed. Duckweed can serve many benefits for an ecosystem, but its impressive growth may provide a nuisance for first-time gardeners. In other words, duckweed may lead to more work and a lot less afternoon relaxation. Its adva duckweed's advantage includes that it provides a food source for fish. It improves water quality, and it reduces the algae photosynthesis process. But duckweed produces new offshoot shoots at a very rapid pace. The aggressive invader can quickly choke out all small ponds and kill aquatic life beneath the surface. Also, yellow flag iris we want like to avoid. It's an attractive plant to grow along your water's edge, but this invasive ornamental Perennial has become a problem in many states. It's easy for the, the yellow flag iris to escape the pond garden and invade streams, wetlands, lakes, swans, and marshes. The last three um, pond plants that I would like to avoid um, are chameleon plant. Um, the chameleon plant craves your water garden's moist soil and shallow water. While its leaves may be colorful, the chameleon plant is highly invasive and very hard to kill. Its creeping habit will allow it to take over your water garden. It may be best to cross this plant off the list and opt for a more controllable ground cover that's just as beautiful and less of a threat to your water garden. Another invasive plant is water lettuce. Free-floating water lettuce resembles an open head of lettuce. While some gardeners may keep water lettuce under control, its invasive property make it illegal to sell in several states. Water lettuce is a rapid spreader, creating a thick floating mass that can cause oxygen depletion, which can cause kill your fish. If it escapes into waterways, it can affect the water flow. Water lettuce's deep mat can provide problems for swimmers and boaters and hinder other recreational activities as well. These thick mats can also crush other aquatic plants that provide shelter and food sources for wildlife. Keep in mind that mosquitoes are attracted to water lettuce. A mat of invasive water lettuce can become a breeding ground for these disease carriers. And finally, European frogbit. This aquatic plant originated in Europe and is an invasive species spreading in the United States and Canada. It can uh, reduce dissolved oxygen levels, hinder recreation, limit water flow, 
harm the fish habitat, and affect native aquatic plants flight conditions. European frog bit is a severe concern in the state of Michigan. According to Michigan State University Extension, this invasive species is spreading along their shorelines and wetlands of Lake Huron, Erie, and Ontario. In 1932, the plant was brought from Europe to farms in Ottawa, Canada. By 1939, the plant had escaped control and spread to the canals. Imagine what it can do today. I hope you've enjoyed the talk on aquatic plants for your water garden. And I'd like to um, thank the Georgia Green Landscape Steward Program. And for anybody that is interested, it is created by the University of Georgia and it is a certification program for businesses and residents in Georgia. If you'd like more information on it, please go to the website below, um, site.extension.uga.edu slash Georgia Green slash. Are there any questions? We're going to ask uh, answer questions at the end of a very short and brief uh, interesting video that that Robin has prepared of, of uh, planting a water garden uh, planter uh, that floats. So stay tuned. Mary? Hi, welcome to our demo today of planting carnivorous plants. The first thing you'll need is a container. I have found this fabulous container uh, made out of styrofoam and covered in a mesh. Usually, I use a container that doesn't have holes in it. If you do use a container with holes, be sure you have a plastic liner. So let's plant our planter today. This ring will actually float in my pond, and I have very aggressive koi that like to play with roots. So with this mesh bottom, the roots can be here and the fish do not disturb it. So I highly suggest looking for one. I found this one online, but there is a shop called Koi Koi in Kennesaw that also carries them. So today we are going to plant our carnivorous plant known as a pitcher plant. They're wonderful around the edge of your pond because they in fact do trap mosquitoes and other annoying pests. So the first thing I'm going to do is mix up my mixture. The mixture for the soil for my floating ring is a plain sphagnum moss and washed and playground sand or sandbox sand. Mix it with water and let it settle. It usually takes a while to get the mixture well stirred and the water to be absorbed. So, by the modern science of photography, I have my mud and you want to um, add water until it's about the consistency of mud, such as this. Be sure you put on gloves. This is a very messy proposition. I also have two bulbs that I overwintered last year. One is a corkscrew rush and the other is a tiger lily, which we talked about all three of these in our talk today. So I am going to plant this floating ring. And the first thing I do is I take out my pitcher plant. I do like to wiggle the roots a little bit because some of the, the dirt a little bit, some of the roots are very, very um, twisted. I will put it in the bottom of my ring and I want it to be at about the, the edge height. Then I'm going to take my beautiful corkscrew brush 
which as you see has gotten very root bound. Now, you can divide these at this point and maybe you'll have more than one. Again, not a clean proposition, but the rewards are huge. And for my final and last bulb, as you see through the mud, I will put it on the other side. So I will have a wonderful tiger lily. Be sure you push the roots in, get them nice and embedded in the mud. And then last but not least, I will simply take the mud that I had just mixed. And remember, you might want to mix it ahead of time so it'll be good and mushy for your planter. And I'm going to simply pat, pat, pat all around until I have filled up the pot with the mud. So you're going to fill the container. You're going to add the water. It takes time for the soil to absorb. And you're going to add more water as needed to create mud. Uh, this technique is suitable for the American pitcher plant, Venus fly traps, and other bog garden plants. Then put this wonderful planter in your pond and by spring you'll have many hours of enjoyment. Thank you. I'd like to thank our promotional partners who made this possible and our media partners who also do a great job of advertising and getting out the word. As you know, this is the final lecture in our series, but if you'd like to see any of the previous uh, lectures, please view the past classes on the North Fulton Master Gardener YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash North Fulton Master Gardener. For future information, go on the link below to register. Learn more about us through our social media through the links listed below. And if you'd like to help us, there are many ways to donate and support the work of the North Fulton Master Gardeners. We also would love for you to support us with the pur purchase of beautiful plants for your garden. And this is a sale that you can simply go on the website below and it ends on April 4th. The website is North Fulton Master Gardener Spring 2, 2023 Give and Garden Sale. Please don't forget to fill out the survey below and thank you for your participation. All right, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Robin. We have a number of questions that have come in into the Q&A box. Um, first off, how do you keep mosquito and or mosquito larvae from uh, out of a freestanding water pond? I'm concerned about a, a West Nile virus outbreak. Well, thank you for um, the questions. And usually they sell, if you have a standing water pond, they sell um, pods or little pellets that you can put in your water garden or your dish to prevent the spread, the disease of mosquitoes. Okay, thank you. Uh, lizard's tail seems highly invasive in my pond and has grown into or onto the neighboring soil. The roots became, became a tangled mat and is difficult to remove. Do you have any tips on containing or eliminating it from my established pond? Yes. That is also another invasive species. It's often called dragon's tail. And lizard tail is um, fairly invasive because it spreads by their uh, stems. So I would recommend to take it all out and put it in a pot in the bottom of your pond. Many of these invasive species can be used in your water garden. You just want to be sure and contain them. If you don't mind and you like water hyacinth and you like water lettuce, go ahead and use it. But again, be aware that it is invasive and you need to contain it. 
You caught my interest when you mentioned damp garden bed. I would love to have an example of how to establish this type of bed in a regular subdivision home with no water garden currently set up. Is this something that can be prepared in the garden bed area or is it a, a container garden? Well, uh, I think that's a good question. You, of course, can do it in a container garden or in a in-ground pond. But do you have a damp area of your landscape that water always tends to accumulate? If you do, this is a perfect area to create a bog garden area. What about papyrus for water gardens? I have seen it for sale locally. And papyrus is another great plant for the water garden. I didn't discuss every plant that are good or that are not good because I wanted, um, because we talked about the ones we did. But papyrus is a beautiful plant. And again, if you contain it, you should be just fine. All right, regarding mosquitoes, are there any water plants that will discourage or eliminate them from breeding in water fountains? I find that even with water flow, it's still, uh, I still have to use dunks. And I would recommend using the dunks and continue to use them because um, mosquitoes are a big problem. And I think that you're um, finding the correct solution. Even with water flow, mosquitoes can land in waterfalls and ponds. Um, I chose water hyacinth and water lettuce. Yes, it took over, but protected my fish in my backyard stream and pond. I removed the excess and, and made a great addition to my compost pile. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I would recommend continuing to either share them with your friends and neighbors or to or compost them so that you have the right balance of invasive plants and water showing so that your fish are going to be healthy as well as your um, other plants. Um, are, are all of these ideas just for standing water or would some work in creeks as well? Well, if your creek leads down to the Chattahoochee or if your creek is self-contained, of course you can do these things. But be careful. I've seen people have their little spot of heaven right there on the creek. And sure enough, downstream, somebody else is going to have their little piece of heaven too. So be sure you contain your plants. They look gorgeous along the side of a creek, but be sure that they are contained. Is a list of plants available as a handout? Uh, we can compile a list and put it on the website, and I'd be happy to do that for you. Otherwise, you, know, you can go to North Fulton Master Gardeners and pond plant and look up pond plants, and they should have a list of good ones and not as good the invasive species. Um, do you have problems with drowning frogs, etc., if wanting a water pond with no koi? Do you add rocks? Uh, how do you avoid this? Well, I think that they're pretty uh, self-sufficient frogs. I do give them lots of places to land. For example, lily pads make a fabulous little resting place for frogs. And of course, the tadpoles turn into frogs and then they somehow leave the pond. So um, I would encourage you to have aquatic plants for them to rest on. Okay, let's see. Can you have a water pond with no plants in pots? Does it limit you too much? No, not at all. Um, these are only if you wanna contain them, but if you want your plants to be very lush and overtake the pond and look like a tropical oasis, go ahead, but just realize that these some of these species do want to take over the pond. But no, they don't have to be contained. You just have to do more work. Okay, let's see. I think that's it for questions. Um, a few people made comments. Um, let's see. Well, one person said, please zip through the 16 favorites. Um, she missed the first 12. Oh, no. this, if you'd like, Robin, you can. If not, we can just share, you know, show the show the viewers that this is up on. Uh, it's being yeah, recorded. I think for the rest of the people um, that that might be a good thing. We are, as you know, recording and we are on YouTube as well as North Fulton Master Gardener 
uh, website. So I think that would be a great place. And this might be the time to thank everybody for coming to our water garden plant class today. And as you know, this is the final class in the garden lecture series for spring. I hope this class will help you get started. But before you leave, please take a moment to fill out the survey so we'll know what you want more of. I wanted to give you a couple of dates that are very important. And if you can save Saturday, April 29th is the 2023 Garden Fair hosted by the Master Gardeners. This year it'll be in Alpharetta at Wills Park and it'll be a great opportunity for plant lovers to come and buy unusual plants and also bring all your plant questions because there'll be lots of master gardeners there. Again, um, we are having the next event, first time in Sandy Springs, say June 3rd from 10 to four. We are having a celebration garden tour, every step a new delight, and there are five master gardener homeowners which are opening their homes in Sandy Springs. There are limited tickets available and the details are, um, we'll put a ticket link in the chat and on our website. Thank you again for coming today and I hope you enjoy your water garden oasis with your new water garden annuals and perennials. Thank you again.